Hello and welcome. Today's topic is realism in great power politics, and there's no one better to explain it than Dr. John Mearsheimer, political scientist and international relations scholar. His views on U.S. foreign policy and the Ukraine war are widely known and respected. First, we'll hear the definition of realism, how power is key, and then the two types of realism. After that, we'll hear a practical example of realism and finally a definition of the liberal theories that stand opposed to realism. Basically what I am is a structural realist. I'm a person who believes that it's the structure of the international system, it's the architecture of the international system that explains in large part how states behave. Another way to say that is I do not believe that domestic politics, I do not believe that the composition or the makeup of individual states matters for very much for how those states behave on a day-to-day -day basis in international politics. Realists believe uh, that power is the currency in international politics and that states care above all else about the balance of power. And the reason states care about the balance of power is because they operate in a world where there's no higher authority that can come to their rescue if they get in trouble. And at the same time, they can never be sure that a really powerful state in that system won't come after them, won't attack them. And if that happens, of course, there's no one that they can turn to. So what that mandates is that states be as powerful as possible relative to the other states in the system. And it says that all states behave that way, democracies as well as authoritarian states, as well as communist states. All states, in effect, are locked in an iron cage and behave roughly the same way. And again, because the system is anarchic, because there's no higher authority that sits above states, you're in a very vulnerable situation. And the way to avoid that is to be very powerful. And to give you a good example that really highlights this, think about the United States of America in the Western Hemisphere. The United States is by far the most powerful country in the Western Hemisphere. It has the Canadians on its northern border, it has the Mexicans on its southern border, it has fish on its eastern border, and fish on its western border. No American ever goes to bed at night worrying about another country attacking it, right? And the reason is because the United States is so powerful. So the ideal situation for any state in the international system is to be as powerful as possible. In the world of realism, there are basically two sets of theories. There are what one might call the human nature realist theories and the structural realist theories. The human nature realists, and Hans Morgenthau, of course, would be the most prominent example of this school of thought, believe that human beings are hardwired with what Morgenthau called an animus dominandi. To put this in slightly different terms, Morgenthau was saying that all human beings are born with a type A personality. And when they get into power, what they want to do is pursue power as an end in itself. So in that story, it's human nature. Structural realists like me and like Ken Waltz believe that it is the structure of the international system, it is the architecture of the system, not human nature, that causes states to behave aggressively. That's what causes states to engage in security competition, and that states can never be certain that another state won't come after them militarily somewhere down the road. If you like what you're seeing, please consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel. A few clicks can make all the difference to us and help the channel grow. Thank you. There are instances where doing the right thing, the moral thing, the correct thing from an ethical point of view is consistent with what's uh, the correct thing to do from a realist point of view. In other words, if you go to war against Adolf Hitler, that's the morally correct foreign policy as well as the strategically correct foreign policy. But you sometimes run into circumstances where 
doing the strategically correct or the realist way of acting is in conflict with what is correct from a moral point of view. And again, going back to World War II, the United States, as you know, very well formed a very close alliance with Joe Stalin and the Soviet Union. Having a close alliance with the Soviet Union is not the ethically correct thing to do. But from a strategic point of view, it made eminently good sense. And we were uh, hardly ever critical about the Soviet Union because of its political system. And we did all of this because the Soviets were our allies. We needed them to defeat Nazi Germany. I'll lay out for you very quickly what are the three major liberal theories today. Uh, the first and most important of the liberal theories is democratic peace theory. And this is a theory that says democracies do not fight against other democracies. So the more the world is populated with democracies, the less likely it is that we will have wars. Liberal democracies have a healthy respect for each other and they can assess each other's intentions. If you're a liberal democracy and I'm a liberal democracy, we know we have value systems that argue against aggression and argue for peaceful resolution of crises. Second theory is economic interdependence theory. And that's the argument that in a globalized world like the one that we live in, and have lived in for a long time, and uh, we're economically interdependent, and we're both getting prosperous as a result of this economic intercourse, the last thing that we're going to do is start a war, either one of us, because who would kill the goose that lays the golden eggs? And then the third liberal argument has to do with institutions, uh, sometimes referred to as liberal institutionalism. And this is the argument that if you can get states into institutions where they become rule-abiding actors. They will obey the rules that dictate that war is not acceptable. To summarize, power is the ultimate currency in international politics. States are concerned about the balance of power since there's no authority in the world that can simply end a war by decree. Nations also deal with the uncertainty of the future. They don't know if or when another state will attack them. There are two types of realism, human nature and structural. The first type argues that human nature causes conflicts because human beings seek power as an end. The structural type argues that it is the architecture of the international system that causes states to behave aggressively. Realism influences the decisions of states even in morally gray areas, such as fighting side by side with the Soviet Union if it means having a chance to defeat Nazi Germany. It's not an ethical approval of the Soviet regime, but a realistic decision given the gravity of the war. Finally, there are liberal theories. Democratic peace theory argues that liberal democracies don't fight each other since they are states with common values. It is possible to anticipate the state's intentions. Economic independence argues that states that depend on each other for trade and become successful as a result won't have any reason to fight. They won't jeopardize what makes them prosperous. Liberal institutionalism states that if states become bound by superior institutions, they will abide by certain rules that forbid war as an acceptable means of settling a dispute. Well, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.